This is a very unexpected... I've become an unexpected fan of Jelly Roll. It's such a weird name, too. I don't even like saying it. I feel corny. But the man has definitely accomplished so much at the young age of 38. And I listened to the Joe Rogan interview with him. And I thought it was so moving and so inspiring. And my voice is very low because of, since I moved down south, I have all these new allergies that are presenting themselves. And <clears throat> um, my voice is like a cross between Demi Moore and I don't know who else, but... It's always low and I'm always, people are always struggling to hear me because if I don't yell, my voice is so low that people are like, we can't hear you. <laughs> so I don't really talk that much. So back to Jelly Roll. His song, Save Me, is so sad. <laughs> I heard it for the first time on the Joe Rogan podcast and then I played it and I cried my eyes out. It is so emotional and this guy comes from like such a genuine viewpoint. You can't not like the guy. And I've had some friends say, oh my God, he's so gross or whatever. He's not gross. I mean, he, he hails from a... You know, addicted mother, a uh, hardworking father, but from the South. And people who emotionally eat can get heavy, right? <laughs> it's so easy. It's not easy to get as big as Jelly Roll, but he also talks about that um, sort of candidly in this interview as well. And he just won a bunch of awards. And he is repped by a major label, so I'm not going to be able to play the song for you. But I, I'll put it in the uh, information below when I'm done with this recording. But here he is talking about, he's telling a story about why he writes music. Can I tell you the story? It's a, yeah, it's a bit of a story. Please. But it's fun. To t I wrote like 100 songs last year. And I didn't feel great about any of them, to be honest. Um, the label liked a few and was trying to pick radio singles, but I just didn't have no conviction about it, Joe. Mm -hmm. And my daughter, at the same time, had found her way into this little back row church in the middle of nowhere about a country where we live. She kept asking me to come, and, you know, I have a tenuous relationship with the Lord, so I wasn't, you know, sure how I'd show up, but I was like, you know what, I'll go. And I went there, there's a hundred people, a little back row church, you know, 20 of them were kids that went to high school with her. And around the same time, I caught this little motherfucker smoking pot, right? She's 15. She's doing 15-year-old kid stuff. And I was like, baby, you won't believe it. By about your age, I started making these same decisions. And I was going to this little bitty church in Antioch. I tell her the story of this church. She don't believe it. So I take her to this old church. It's still there. It's called Winsett Chapel Baptist Church. And that night, riding home with her, I didn't tell nobody. But in my mind, I thought, that's the album I'm writing. Like, fuck every song I wrote. I'm writing this album. I called Zach Crowell. He produced every Sam Hunt song ever. You know, one of the biggest producers in town I've known in my whole life. He's here with me right now. And uh, I said, dude, I want to write an album called Going to Church. And I just kind of want to write this kind of journey and just kind of A to Z and write a real project. And Zach was like, I'm in. He's like, well, why don't you just call it Wits at Chapel? So that's how we ended up doing Wits at Chapel. So when Me of Favor came into the fold, I was like, what's worship music for center sound like? <laughs> Like, what does a motherfucker like me? You know, because you know, when you're in church, it's holy, holy, you are great. I was like, I don't, I don't necessarily feel that way. So how do I feel? You know what I mean? And then it was like, only talk to God when I need a favor. You know, and I was mm -hmm. like, we got to build it with a choir and big production. I want that old uh, stop, yeah. clap, mm, you know, that old yeah. church feel. And I want to bring, like, that vibe of that church, you know, into the, into the, and the whole thing is the whole album is built on that vibe of, like, 
There's fire and brimstone. There's everything you go through in a Sunday morning worship service. If you've ever been to a Sunday in the South worship service, they're gonna, you're going to convince you you're a horrible human at some point. You're going to hell. And then at the end, they'll hit a major key instead of a minor one finally and go, but there's hope. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I was like, how do I, <laughs> I, was like, how do I write that? You know? Man, I, well, I've always been a fan of those preachers. I, I love the way they, they captivate an audience. Yeah. And even if they're crazy, even if they're talking nonsense, no, there's, there's sure. something exciting about watching some dude preach the word and just yell it out just and on fire. On fire. So I got a, I got, I'm going to send you a link to the album, but I got a preacher throughout the whole album doing that, Joe. Ooh. They tied the record together. Oh, so wow. you read, like the album starts with this dude like, and by the grace of God, we were saved and it just drops the first song Whoa, it's cool man that's amazing I, I got nerdy dude I went like I old it. school dude I went like back to the 90s dude. I was in the studio like we were just getting high and coming up with shit beautiful yeah it was so much fun it was probably the most fun I've ever had writing an album because it's the first time I've sat down a long time and wrote an album instead of just writing a bunch of songs and then picking an album mm. you know what I mean I was like no I'm writing like we're gonna sit down and write an album so did, did that just came out of the blue inspirationally yeah just I just wasn't just felt like something to Man. do. So when you write an album, it's like writing a book or writing a screenplay. And it makes sense that he decided to write an album based on this subject matter. And just so you know that he and Joe are smoking a lot of pot in this episode. Uh, so they're really high and they're sharing a ton of music with one another and it was so sweet and I was so unexpectedly moved by this interview and simultaneously inspired to start writing new stuff I just finished um, editing a, a script that I worked on in 2020 with somebody else and I re-edited it and it came out really well, and I'm waiting to hear if somebody likes it or not. And that's exciting, but I get what he's saying. Like, when you're writing, you want it all to be, like, sort of congruent with that feel. And <clears throat> I wish that I could play Save Me for you guys because it is, like, it's, like, Chris Cornell meets I don't know who else and he he does play music in the interview but I'm not sure if I'll get flagged for it because like I said he's right by a major label however he does own all his own music because he had come to this record label with a billion views on YouTube he had a baked in business so he was able to negotiate a really good deal whereby he's on a major label but he gets to continue to own all his own music which is unheard of so i'll play a little more i'm gonna get like all the way real i didn't understand what was i had commercial success for the first time in my life and i didn't know how to deal with that so you do what everybody does in that moment i'm sure you may or may not have been there in your career early where you like you chase it then you're like oh my god hold on i can be yeah. And I realized that the songs wouldn't sound like Jelly Roll no more. Ah. You know? And I was like, no, I'm doing the thing that people do where they fuck their career up. I was like, I'm not doing that, man. So, so you think that that's just a normal trap that happens to everybody that gets success and they don't want to fuck up that success? So they f try to make a formula for what they think the people liked about their early shit? Yes. Yes. 100%. Or they chase whatever the poppy record was or whatever the record that did the most so it's like how do I write another song like that mm. so I was coming off of a hit that I, I the one I gave you the plaque for Son of a Sinner was my first radio hit like hit hit and I was like I didn't know how to come out of it because I didn't write the song for radio I wrote the song like I wrote every other song but then you start thinking oh I can write songs for radio uh, I had fucking 70 radio songs like fuck I'm not you know it's like no nah, man I just need to I need to do what got me to radio I didn't do what Jelly Roll does. And I was like, I know what it is. I'm going to get back in my Fox home and write me a fucking album, dude. You know what I'm saying? That's beautiful. I took it off Music Row and went back to some little old back-ass studio in the backwoods. And we wrote it kind of like, you know, like we wrote all my early shit. 
I feel like it's like every level of success that you get, you're presented with a unique problem that you haven't seen before. And it's up to you to just figure it out. Mm. Just figure it out. What, what are you doing this for? And I think that applies to everything. I, I know it applies to comedy. It definitely seems to apply to music. I think it probably applies to everything. Figure out what you're doing it for. Like, what, Why do you like to do I know you have to make a living, but once all that's taken care of, like, what are you doing it for? You should be doing it for the love of this thing. Whatever this thing is that you do, you, you are a love-spreading machine as a human being. <laughs> right. Whether it's your love of carpentry, whether it's your love of electronics, what, what is it? What's your thing, man? Right. Everybody's got a thing, yeah. but not everybody finds a fucking thing. Yeah. That's the problem with this world. Mm. So people get trapped in something that's not their thing, and that's that's what they are now. And they, they don't ever get to express themselves in a way that would make them feel good. Well, for me, I always call it the why. And it's like what you said, even with the music. And that's what happened with those 70 songs. When the why comes down to, oh, this is catchy, or this is a good song, I'm past the point of like, if this, I want to help people, Joe. Like, my music has always been therapeutic. My music has always been for people. What got me into music was my mother. So my mother was a woman who struggled with extreme mental health issues and drug addiction. And she would never come out of her room, Joe. Oh, no. He's going to cry. I can't. I can't. He, for some reason, this interview made Joe Rogan cry like three times. It made me cry three times. It's, he is an unbelievable human being, an unbelievable soul. So I'm going to finish it here because I have things to do. It's my day off. And um, I just got my hair cut. <laughs> and I'm going to head over to Delray Beach and do some stuff. So... Do yourself a favor, watch the Joe Rogan interview with Jelly Roll, listen to Save Me, and you're welcome. You're going to fucking cry, unfortunately, <sighs> but it's so good. It's so good. Jelly Roll is going to make you into a country music fan. <laughs> I mean, it's true. It's so true. I hope you enjoyed the small section of the interview that I shared, but Jelly Roll also mentions, this is very unusual, that his wife is an ex-prostitute and that he is an ex-drug dealer. And when they were at the Country Music Awards, they were like looking at each other like, how do we get here? You know, like it's so surreal. So if you're an artist, if you're a writer, if you're a musician, watch this. It's going to make you want to do all the stuff that you were meant to do.